Is the Federal Reserve done giving free money to big banks? You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. It is Monday. I am Matt Copenheffer. This here is David Hansen. David, the American Music Awards were yesterday, and Taylor Swift and Justin Timberlake cleaned up. If you were to come back in a second life, would you rather come back as Justin Timberlake or Taylor Swift? Justin I, Timberlake. I know you'd rather say Miley Cyrus. That's not, not an option. Giving, I'm not would, giving you that option. I would say Miley, but it's Justin. You got to go Mickey Mouse Club. You got the movies. You got the singing. It's the whole package. I like it. That's a strong play. Speaking of strong plays, let's go to what the government's up to. Fifth Third to play, pay $25 million to Freddie Mac in mortgage settlement. We've got another related one here. This is from Wells Fargo. U.S. government seeks to add Wells Fargo vice president to mortgage fraud suit. What we have here is uh, Wells Fargo. This suit is going after misconduct going all the way back to 2001. The suit was already in progress. Now the government wants to loop in Kurt Lofrano, who is responsible for reporting materially defective loans to HUD. Apparently they're saying he wasn't doing that. And with Fifth Third, you got $25 million going to Freddie Mac for defective loans prior to 2009. 2001? 2001. That is... That might as well be a millennium when we're talking about <laughs> banks and, and stuff that's gone on in between that. I mean, that's... What even happened in 2000? That's a little crazy. And the $25 million for Fifth Third, obviously that sounds very, very small. And when we compare that to Bank of America, Bank of America is around 18 times the size of Fifth Third. So if we times this by 18, it's still not even a half a billion dollars there. So I don't think this is a huge deal for Fifth Third. Yeah, these seem like little numbers, and, and we're not likely to see a repeat of J.P. Morgan's $13 billion, but this does so, show that suits are continuing to ripple out. Uh, also, I thought it was interesting, in a related note, in a recent panel discussion, Dan Stepano, who's the deputy chief counsel at the OCC, said that the fines in these settlements are more art than science. You gotta like that. Got to love that. All love right, that. moving on to the next headline Art. from the FT. They say, U.S. banks warn Fed interest cut could force them to charge depositors. Now, there have been talks, I guess, or some people suggesting, hey, maybe the Fed should cut what they're paying banks on reserves, mm -hmm. and that could potentially spur lending. But banks are saying, hey, if you cut that, we're just going to pass that cost on to our depositors and charge them because banks have to pay FDIC insurance. So while they're getting interest from the Fed. They're also paying the FDIC for insurance there, so it's not exactly completely free money. So to me, it seems very unlikely that the Fed would cut this to, to nothing here. Well, I think we're seeing the, the limits of monetary policy here again. It's logical that the Fed would want to try to push the banks to lend more. Uh, and on the one hand, I should say, as bank investors, we shouldn't be too happy about that because we only want to see the banks lending if there are good loans out there to be made. But loan-to-deposit ratios are, are particularly low right now at Bank of America. It's about 82 percent. Wells Fargo even lower at 76 um, percent. But, but again, it's the Fed would like to push them to make more loans, but you got to have people wanting to borrow, and you got to have uh, creditworthy companies and consumers wanting to borrow. And that's not necessarily the case right now when people are uneasy about the economy. Yep. Third headline, we've got Bloomberg here. Progressive Lewis, who championed cannabis rights, dies. This is uh, obviously a sad story. This is the former CEO, uh, the driving force behind Progressive, uh, passed away. Yes, sad story. Interesting headline there with the cannabis rights, but I guess, I he, think I guess he was championing marijuana to be legal? I think it's a ridiculous it Seems odd to put that in the headline. He but built one of the biggest insurers in the country, and in the headline, it's, I mean, the headline is dominated by champion cannabis rights. Yes, very strange. Uh, but speaking of progressive, last week we saw Pine River, uh, Steve Kuhn over at Pine River, who, which kind of controls Two Harbors, one of your favorite mortgage reads out there, and they came out and said, hey, we're shorting progressive. And it was an interesting uh, presentation in terms of why they're shorting progressive, and they cited Number one, valuation compared to, to peers like Allstate. At 18 times earnings, they think Progressive looks a little rich. But the main catalyst that they were pointing to were self-driving cars and the fact that they don't think there's going to be automobile accidents anymore it, when we look further into the future. And they were specifically talking 2025. That's when they think there will be no longer people driving cars. It's all going to be driverless. Uh, and they, they targeted Progressive because 92% of their revenue comes from auto insurance. They're the most pure play in the space. Seemed a little strange 
for your catalyst to be self-driving cars. I think it sounds nice. I think we'd all love to, there to be less accidents out there and more efficiency, but I think it's going to be a tough road till we get to all driverless cars. I don't know about you. Yeah, I'm excited about the idea of driverless cars because I'm not a big fan of driving, to be honest. But uh, but I don't know that I'm shorting progressive based on that. One other note on, on Lewis during during his tenure, uh, if we look to 19, he's, he was CEO for a lot longer than this. But we, if we look between 1992 and 2000, 2000 was when uh, he retired as uh, CEO. Progressive tangible book value per share, and remember that's the metric that Warren Buffett likes to look at. Tangible book value per share went up nearly 5x at Progressive. At Berkshire Hathaway, it was up 3.6 times. There you go. Boom. Probably a little bit smaller of a base starting though. A little bit. Probably. Little bit. But still, still impressive. Very impressive. It's been a very impressive company, and I think they still have a lot going for them, but it'll be interesting to see how Pine River's short plays out for them. Yeah, not sure I'm not sure I'm quite on board with that one. Anyway, uh, the focus for today, speaking of Warren Buffett, it is Warren Buffett. We got an email, was it last week or maybe even the week before? It was last week. Last week. From from a uh, listener, Matthew Murphy. I uh, had a couple questions about Warren Buffett, and the first of them had to do with the investment in ExxonMobil. And essentially what Matthew was uh, asking is isn't Buffett's idea that he wants to hold companies hold investments for a, the long term, if not your lifetime. Uh, and, and his view was that we've got the, the global warming going on and it's going to be very difficult for us as a society, as a, as a globe, as a, as a world, to continue burning fossil fuels mm -hmm. without overheating the atmosphere. Uh, and so from that perspective, don't we have to be concerned about the fact that Exxon, at some point, won't be able to sell any more oil because we can't burn it because we're going to overheat the world? You concerned about that? Do you think that this is Buffett not looking at the big picture? I'm sure, I'm sure Buffett's considered it, and it, it is a concern. I know there's two sides of the argument whether where we're heading there, and we're not going to get into the whole global warming argument here. But if we look at Exxon, yes, they're... You are not, in fact, a scientist. I'm not a scientist, full disclosure. Little known fact. Um, David is not a scientist. So yes, they're obviously big in the oil business, but Exxon, it's not like they only do oil. I mean, they're the largest energy company in the world here. So yes, if oil, we become less dependent on oil, I think the company's in good position too. And I'm not an oil uh, or an energy analyst, but I think they're in good position as the market leader to pivot in towards to other areas of the energy market. So I think that's where he's looking. I, I think part of it too is that for better or for worse, without getting into the politics, without getting into the right or wrong of it, a lot of Buffett's investments uh, are trying to invest in things that, that are reliable, trying to invest in businesses that are reliable. And if you think about how long uh, oil has been a, a reliable commodity mm -hmm. and to think out into the future, <clears throat> Will we continue to use oil to power the economy? Uh, the likelihood seems high. I don't disagree with where Matthew's coming from, but um, I can see why Buffett would be, would be looking towards oil. Not to mention that, to me, Exxon looks cheap today. And plus, you've got great capital allocators at the top of Exxon, mm -hmm. which I think is probably pretty attractive to Buffett. So, so maybe it's about more than just the, the core business, even though you've got... So, so I think that. things could change, obviously things could change and oil could become less needed, but betting on the status quo isn't the worst thing to do, things not change. Like, it can be, right. it, can, it can be terrible, but in this case, I think that probably has a lot to do with it. Right. Uh, the second question or the second part of the email was asking about Buffett and the banking meltdown, the financial meltdown, and how can Buffett be considered one of the greatest investors of our time? given that he was invested in banks, particularly Wells Fargo and U.S. Bancorp, when the entire banking industry melted down. If he was such a great investor, Matthew queries, why didn't he see this coming and how could he have still been in banks? It's a very interesting question. It's a good point. I, haven't, I had personally hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, we should say that Wells Fargo and U.S. Bancorp, they weren't the ones that were really, really damaged in the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. They weren't the Bank of America's or the Citigroup's of the world here. They did take TARP. Both of the companies did take TARP, so we can't say that they didn't take a bailout here. But I don't think, I don't think we can say Buffett is this. Obviously, he's a genius. He's proven that. But he can't see everything. I mean, obviously, he, it, that's a, it's a very it was a very complex time. And it's also you should also note that during the financial crisis, 
Buffett and Berkshire had the cash to come in and make deals. So it's not like their business was completely hindered by the financial crisis. So they were obviously prepared for this kind of doomsday scenario. It's not like they were sitting back and taking a bailout. So they were sitting there able to make sweetheart deals. So I see where he's coming from. But those two banks, U.S. Bank Corp and Wells Fargo, were well positioned, and Berkshire was well positioned to take advantage of the good deals there. I have a bit of a stronger view on this one than, than the last question. And in, in particular, I think that there's a very strong argument to be made that Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank Corp did not need a bailout. And the problem with, when it came to TARP, when it came to the bailouts, the problem was that you couldn't go in and selectively give bailouts to certain banks because then Bank of America becomes a pariah, Citigroup becomes a pariah, and then you, you you're in the same situation that you were before the bailouts because nobody wants to do business with them. Right. Nobody wants to be the counterparty uh, because they've been marked as the only bad ones. So that was part of it. The other part of it is, is that if you look at the, the entire sector melting down and where was Buffett? Buffett was with the banks that were set apart, mm -hmm. that were the better operators, that were the best operators. And I think that that's pretty significant. And finally, if you wanted to expand this out and not just say, well, these banks didn't need a bailout. Well, what if none of the banks got a bailout? Then how would you look at Buffett's involvement in the banking sector? Because Wells Fargo can't stand on an island if Bank of America and, and Citigroup and many other banks are going under all at the same time. And, and I think the best thing I can say there is just that if all of those, if, if all the banks cratered, if all those banks cratered at the same time, there was no bailout, there was no uh, rescue, we would have had a much bigger problem than just thinking about the banking mm -hmm. sector. This would have been uh, an economic calamity, not a banking calamity. And to some extent, I think you've got to think, and I, I think I'm sure Buffett thinks in terms of government can't let that happen. Mm -hmm. Just can't. So you, you've got to look at things realistically and understand that this is probably what's going to happen if that kind of situation comes around. Kind of, uh, if the bailout was there, whether you agreed with it or not, I guess you could say he re he realized that that was a possibility or a strong possibility. And he's kind of just more than playing, a strong. I think playing by the rules that are that are in the game. So. Well, playing by reality. Yeah. Pl playing by the well, playing by the likelihood. Because as with all investing, you got to think in terms of probabilities. So if you run into this sort of banking disaster, banking calamity, so what's the probability that the government steps in to rescue the banks? I would I would argue that it's somewhere in like the ninety percent kind of range. Uh, maybe that's maybe that's looking back with a little bit too much. Uh, uh, hindsight, but uh, I imagine that he was thinking. Would the government bail out Twitter today? Would the government bail out Twitter? Yeah. Very no. crucial to the economy. No. <laughs> are, you, are you thinking they no, would? No, I'm just joking. But there, there's, a pro there's the probability where it's zero <laughs> that they'd get a bailout. So. Uh, maybe not zero. I mean, there's zero probability on very many things. Uh, on not very many things. But maybe zero. Close Are to you zero. getting your grammar right? Zero percent. <laughs> Me getting my grammar right, zero percent. There you go. Uh, the game for today, we're doing a little making the grade for reminder for new viewers, for, for those viewers who haven't seen this fun game before. We're going to pre present a couple of scenarios, and then we're going to do our artistic rendering of our view on those scenarios. Mm -hmm. The first of them involves Michael Corbat in Citigroup. Michael Corbat's first year as Citigroup. David, what's your grade? Alrighty. Giving them a, uh, oh, let me fix that. What do you got? Giving them a second place finish. <laughs> We're going Olymp <laughs> Olympic style here. Second place finish for City. Why didn't you draw Michael Corbett and Brian Moynihan standing I didn't, I didn't, there? I didn't have enough time. So yeah, you can see I have, I have Bank of America uh, being first there, Citigroup being second. And the reason is the stock's been great under Corbett. It's up 40, 50% since he took over in October of last year. So it's been a little bit over a year, we should say that. But more impressive is the multiple, the price to tangible book multiple has gone up 35%. These markets, mar markers. Yeah, they don't smell good. Uh, the price to tangible book multiple has gone up 35% over last year. That's the market signaling. They have faith in Citigroup, they have faith in Corbett. Bank of America gets the first there because their price to tangible book multiple has gone up 60% over the same time period. Maybe the market's saying, we like them both, but I like Bank of America a little bit more. That's why they get second place, not first. What do you say? I've got a big green thumbs up. <laughs> and the reason it's green is because I, I only have a green marker. Somebody stole my black marker. Uh, big thumbs up for Michael Corbat here. A lot of the same reasons you talked about. Um, I, I actually wasn't listening to anything you said. But 
Um, <laughs> Citigroup stock, uh, I, up about 43% over the past year. Total return, 24% for the S&P 500. That is a great return. A lot of that was driven by the, uh, the price tangible book value multiple expansion that you were just talking about. Um, and we actually, Chris Hill here at The Fool recently interviewed Mike Mayo, who has been a longtime banking skeptic, is still fairly skeptical on many banks, but he is a big fan of Corbett, big fan of Citigroup, and I think that's the kind of, um, the, the kind of views you're getting on Citigroup now with Corbett as the uh, CEO. So I think he's doing a great job over there. All right. Next scenario, we've got the Department of Justice's Usage of FERIA, that's the Financial Institutions Reform, Ref Recovery and, en and Enforcement Act. Chance that I get that out the first time? Zero percent. Zero, zero percent. <laughs> and this was the, I guess, the law or the whatever it was that, that allowed people to go after, or it moved the statute of limitations from five years to ten, right? So it kind of extended. Well, this is dating back to the last banking crisis. Right. So this is dating back to the savings and loan era. But yeah, the, the, two, the two big issues at play here, uh, the reason that FREA has been so great for the Department of Justice, longer statute of limitations, 10 years, but also this is it's civil, so lower, uh, lower hurdle, yep. if you will, to overcome. All right, I'm going with a, through a baseball field here, and there's a foul pole, and the ball is in play. That's fair. It's fair here, and whether you agree with the usage of this or not, they're abiding by the rule of the law, makes it civil, 10 years, statute of limitations. It's fair. What do you say? What is that? <laughs> <This> is <laughs> Chances that I draw a good picture on this show. Is that a hammer? Zero percent. That is a smiling hammer. There you go. That is a smiling hammer. Faria has been a big, effective hammer for the DOJ. And from their perspective, and from a prosecutorial perspective, great job. Bravo. I, I mean, it, it's, they're extracting billions of dollars out of the big banks. Uh, and from their perspective, you got to say they're doing something right. All right. Last scenario of the day, making the grade. You put a third in there? A Thanksgiving scenario. Make this. the grade, checking your portfolio at the Thanksgiving dinner table. What's your grade on that? Uh, I've got an easy one. Okay, let's see. That's an F minus. We're, we're all for being aware of your portfolio here, but this Thanksgiving on Thursday, do not be checking your portfolio. Take some time to spend, spend some time. So, so on, you, you mean like being on your smartphone, checking yeah. your stock Don't prices? That. Oh, that is a, I'm expanding that F into That's a, a big fail. fail. That's a fail. That's a big fail. Um, however, sitting around the Thanksgiving, the, the Thanksgiving table and talking about the importance of investing, talking about the great companies that you're invested in, with your family, sitting around, sharing in yes. the greatness that investing is, that's a, that's a, a thumbs up. That's a thumbs up, <laughs> we not a all. thumbs down. <laughs> all right, closing out in the Twitter sphere. David, what is our first tweet for today? First tweet is from, it's a bunch of acronyms. I'm not even gonna say it. Uh, yeah, something weird, <laughs> some Canadian thing. Uh, it says, 84% of Canadians see real estate as a good long-term investment. Are they wrong? Yep. What do you think? Yep. Not agreeing with it? That you're not on the Canadian housing boom train? Nope. They're wrong. I agree. Uh, <laughs> good good, good long-term living place, good long-term shelter. I can agree with that. Real estate, maybe not the best long-term investment up there. Uh, we've talked about it before. The banks... That would, this is most concerning to if there is a, a bubble, a housing bubble up there. RBC and TD, most exposure to the housing market up there. So if you own any of those stocks, just maybe have your, your alerts up a little bit. A lot, lot of good reasons to own a home. There are a lot of good reasons to own a home. There are also ways to, to invest in, in houses, rent them out, become like a little mini Blackstone, if you will, yep. buy, buy some houses, rent them out to people. But I, I, you know, the, the Canadian housing market has looked a little... Bubblicious. I, I don't even like saying the word bubble. It just makes me uneasy to say it. But um, you know, Robert Schiller has come out with a lot of good research too, as far as the long-term uh, re returns from owning from owning a home straight up, mm -hmm. and they're not great. Yeah. So, not, not going to argue with that. him. He has a Nobel Prize. He does. That's a fact. I would I would still be okay with arguing with him, but not on that point. All right, moving on to the, the second tweet. tweet. We've got Nick Timiros. One of these days, I'm going to get his name perfectly right. I think right. it's Timiros. Timiros. Okay. Good. I'm banking on that. U.S. pending home sales down for the fifth straight month in October. 
to 1.6% below year ago level. David, year over year, they're falling now. Shouldn't we be freaking out? Year over year for the first time in two and a half years. So I don't think we should be freaking out. I think this is actually a good thing for the housing market. We just talked about a housing market. We don't want it to go. It's probably not healthy for it to go up double digits every year and everyone just think, oh, it's such a great long-term investment. I think if we can get back to normalized levels where the houses, the prices are secure, they trick up a little bit, but... Whatever, I'm, tot I'm totally discounting those numbers. That's October. It was That's October. budget shutdown, government government messing up the entire economy month. Uh, I, I'm going to wait for November, wait for December. But then we're going to be like, it's Thanksgiving. That messed everything up. Then Chris... Well, at least, but you're comparing Thanksgiving... Martin Luther over, King thanks, Day. <laughs> Thanksgiving <Valentine's> versus... Day. <laughs> Ides of March. We're never going to get away from anything. Well, the Ides of March, that's fair. That, that is, really screws up the housing market. That's real. All right, final <laughs> yes, tweet final of the day. Tweet. This one... If it, about, if it is about the Ides of March, I'm going to be it's real. It's about Bitcoin. This is from Rebecca Jarvis at Rebecca Jarvis. She says, Bitcoin rent. Really? And she had a picture on her Twitter of the, it was a, a chalkboard sign outside of <clears throat> an apartment building. And there's the picture. It says, open house, elevator studio for $24.50 a month or 4.26 Bitcoin. People are now advertising rent in Bitcoin. Are you now more a believer in Bitcoin that people <laughs> are accepting it for rent? Uh, it doesn't make me. It doesn't make me necessarily a big believer. But at least there's something additional that you can spend it on. You and I, uh, our, our our faithful viewers can can look forward to this. But on Thanksgiving, we're gonna have a little special about us uh, in Bitcoin. And we had a really tough time trying to spend Bitcoin out in the real world. And so at least this is an example of of being able to buy some real good or service with Bitcoin. And that's the kind of thing that's going to need to increase, not a little bit, but a whole, whole lot for a little bit. Was that a pun? That was, bit that by was. bit. Oh, God. Bitcoin's coming. Here we go. Here we go. Go ahead. You got any more? No, I'm fine. That's good. <laughs> Bitcoin, it'll survive. <laughs> it'll survive. You're still, I mean, you're still a believer. I mean, if we're doing a bull bear here, you are like the most raging Bitcoin okay, bull. I'm <laughs> raging bull, but I'm leaning bull. I'm more bullish than bearish. You're putting oh, yeah, most of your portfolio into Bitcoin. Only 80%. Only 80%. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, we, are on, we are on Twitter. We love to, get, uh, we love to hear from our Twitter uh, faithful at TMF Financials. Our email address is WTMI at fool.com. Uh, viewers and listeners can email us questions, comments, whatever. And we are, of course, on iTunes. For yes. those who aren't listening on the podcast, give us a rating. We love getting ratings. But only when they're five oh, stars. Only when they're good. Only five star ratings. If you hate this and you're listening and you think you'd give it a two or three star rating, just save your time. Yeah. Don't, it's Thanksgiving oh, week. Yeah. Relax. Yeah, relax. <laughs> well, that's all we got for today. I'm Matt Copenheffer. This is David Hansen. We'll see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.